Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor, enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. And Robert Sharples. Hi. And in this episode, we're going to discuss English as an additional language and the nuance and um, hopefully get into a bit of depth. But first, Chris, what are you reading for? Hey, what are you reading for? So over the past week, I've had reason to return to some of my favourite papers relating to reading fluency. And um, one that I've not mentioned on the podcast yet is uh, Kuhn et al's 2010 paper, Aligning Theory and Assessment of Reading Fluency. Uh, the reason I'm a big fan of this one in particular is it gets into some of the knotty arguments about what the construct actually is, what it can mean, and actually deals with the idea of what makes this construct useful. Because there is a tendency in certain areas to basically use the word reading fluency to mean the same thing as just like reading capability. As soon as you insist that a high degree of comprehension must be there for reading fluency, it becomes on some level a less useful construct. And what I liked about this paper is it kind of gets into those issues, um, unties them, kind of pulls them apart and tries to leave us with something that is intentionally useful for educators and researchers, which, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed. What about you, Rob? What are you reading for? So I've just started two new books this week, both of them very work books. Um, I'm reading Jeff McSwan's Multilingual Perspectives on Translanguaging. So translanguaging, we know, is this, is this big set of theories about how the boundaries between languages are not perhaps as as solid as we thought they were. And there's different versions of it. Some focus on how languages are stored in the brain and that they might actually be stored without boundaries. So if you know a little French or a little English or a little Urdu or Hindi, in the brain, they're not separate languages, but they're a broader language capacity. And then there's a the social side that we can move between these languages more fluidly in the classroom and in society. And there's been this debate, and I, I felt recently that, that the kind of translanguaging side of the argument has really dominated in my reading. So Jeff McSwan's a, an academic at Arizona State University and has been one of the most prominent critics of that way of thinking. So this is very much against the zeitgeist, but he's talking about multilingualism as in separate languages in the brain. And I'm really enjoying the way it weaves the the practical, the cognitive, the social together in this in this set of arguments. And I really enjoyed that one, except a student has pinched it off me now, so I've got to stop about a third of the way through. And I'm reading Jim Cummins' book on rethinking the education of multilingual students. So I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with the work of Jim Cummins. He's a Canadian academic. I think he retired quite a few years ago now, but he just keeps accepting speaking invitations because he's so popular. So Jim's work was really, really foundational and helping us to think about bilingualism as something positive and giving us some of the, the conceptual tools to think about right um what does it mean to be bilingual in the classroom and he, he wrote an earlier book called um bilingual children caught in the crossfire which gives you an idea of how his work connects to politics and policy so those two i think is two really big thinkers in my field that i've been enjoying and i'm reading another book just for fun i cannot remember the title of it it's got one of those sort of multi-stranded narratives. I can't ever, when I pick it up but before I go to sleep, remember where I am in a story, who is speaking at any time, or what on earth it is about. So I'm just desperately trying to finish it, and it's going to sink without a trace in my mind. These two, I think, might stick. So, Kieran, what are you reading for? They both sound fascinating. I mean, from a purely selfish point of view, I, I spend a lot of time learning other languages, and I've always wondered if learning another language is adding to what's already there or you know should i learn italian because spanish is very very closely related that kind of thing so actually you know if it's suitable for the lay person i might uh, i might give that a go at some point i might turn borrowed from your student mine is related to last week's episode chris we were exploring early mathematics julian grenier has written a wonderful blog i think this was published via the charter college um rose and shine seminal principles of instruction a dead end or a must read for teachers in early years and it is, as you would expect, a really considered, inquisitive, I think probing at times, um, but always insightful 
um, sort of exploration of quite a contested um, part of um, early years pedagogy. And so, you know, I I haven't met Julian. I haven't seen him speak, but I imagine he's very softly spoken, very carefully spoken because it comes across in his writing as if, you know, I'll ask you a question, both of you. Um, this breaks with the flow of the what you're reading for section, but I've always wanted to ask you, how do you find the papers that you read? You're both busy people. You don't have, you know, university libraries that that remove all the paywalls for all these these journals, but you you read such consistently interesting and thought provoking stuff, including a lot of academic papers that that most people wouldn't touch. How do you find it? How do you choose it? Obviously, you know, just search. The obvious thing is Google Scholar finding anything that happens to be free. Reaching out to the authors themselves is a consistently um, excellent way to get stuff. I'm really surprised how often you can just, there's a paper, who's the lead author? Can I find what university they're at? Can I get an email address? Usually it's a minute, maybe two minutes to go through all of that. And then maybe letting away a little trade secret here. I have like a template email for when I send uh, this kind of thing to academics, which basically is all honest. It's I'm looking to find this paper. I'm really interested in learning more about your work. Would you, would it be possible to get access to X, Y, and Z? So if it isn't on Scholar, then that's where I go. I'm also fortunate enough now that I've um, got lots of um, colleagues who are interested in stuff who quite often will just recommend a paper to me or say, oh, I've, I've already been sent this by the academic who wrote it and they're perfectly happy to share it. So um, yeah, the, the same route as most people, but I do think getting in touch with the authors themselves is a, is a bit of a, a useful trick. I have notification set up for keywords on Google Scholar. So anything from, I suppose I think I started in 2022, comes up every on like a, a weekly email. So a, a variation theory would be an example. There are many different, I don't know, types of variation theory. There's a, there's a, there's a mechanical engineering application too, but you sift through it and, you know, you find interesting ones. But I think mostly it's just paying attention to people and who they're reading and who, you know, for instance, uh, I'm quite interested in mathematics and the kind of strategy selection that people might go through in their minds. And so there's, a, there's an American, um, John Starr, and basically if he has, has referenced someone in his papers, I, I'll t tend to follow. But a lot of the time, Chris and I will have a discussion, should I say, about a paper, and then we'll go through the sources in that paper and then things branch off from there. There's, there's, um, there's a really big move. So um, at my institution, we've just been asked to include a, a Creative Commons license on everything we publish for what's called the author's accepted version. So you, um, you, you submit a, a paper and the, the editor, after some time and some reviews, will send back a set of uh, queries and comments that you respond to, and then you submit your final version. Now, somewhere along that process is is where it officially leaves your hands and goes into the journal's hands. And some people say that's um, when the, the version you first submit before review, some be it's your post-review version before it's typeset. Um, but that's called the author's accepted copy. So the, the copy that you wrote that's accepted by the journal. And now as part of the, the broader commitment to open science, we submit those to a university repository under a Creative Commons license. So you should now be able to get any research that's published uh, and maybe not the published version, but the, the very, very, very similar pre-publication version, absolutely free. Sometimes they embargo it. So you say, well, it's, you know, it won't come out for six months or 12 months, but I'm, I'm delighted if anyone emails me and asks for a copy of something. <laughs> One thing people forget is just how little feedback you get when you, when you write for scholarly publications. So it goes off and, you know, some people might read it and, and you occasionally, you know, get comments from your colleagues in your close area. That's why conference is really good because you actually get to meet some of the people working in your field. But to get an email from someone who said, I, I, I've i seen this, I'm, I'm really interested in reading it. It's fantastic. So you said a trade secret was try getting in touch directly with the authors. Well, a trade secret from the receiving end is, I'd be delighted if someone wrote to me and, and just to know that it was useful to people's work would, would, would be a real boost. So um, I would definitely, from the receiving end, encourage people to write out that, that it, it's not like your email is going to be read and sort of poo-pooed and think, oh, why, why, why would they write to me? Why, why would someone want to read my work? 
you know, that person will give a little whoop inside. Oh, someone's reading my work. That's fantastic. I mean, that is wonderful to hear. I mean, you know, almost hand in hand with uh, mm. this kind of sort of, I don't know, nerdery comes some sort of neurosis. And so you always do imagine, you know, even though it's totally unrealistic, the fact that, you know, oh, you know, this person might be much too important. So it's great to hear that that's not actually the, the case. Yeah, that's great to hear we might be much too important. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it has not been my experience. It's a humbling profession in a lot of ways because you, you know, I, I tend to think of, of my work as, as, well, I've come to this phrase, putting evidence at the service of practice. But you you want to do work that has that has use that has value, but at the same time you're not the one doing that work, so you're always on the the margins of things, and sometimes that's a really important position to be in. You do look at things differently, you doing different ideas, but you know a lot of people will say basically the minute you step out of the classroom, you're you're you lose touch with reality, and I think if you're someone who's, I mean yeah, I, I teach week in week out, but I teach university students, it's very different very different activity so I think the other side is you're constantly thinking what contribution does my work make to this thing we're all engaged in and the system's not perfect it doesn't work in lots and lots of areas and I, and I think a lot of people are tied to keeping it going in a lot of ways and, and you don't get a lot of distance and space so there's definitely value in it but I think from the other side as well it's it, you know you might look at academics and say well they're they're you know too busy doing all this research but I think for a lot of us, it's it's a sense of having to constantly justify your work in terms of what impact and value it has. So it definitely cuts both ways. And I think conversations like this are really powerful. Excellent. I mean, with, with that in mind, would you like, Rob, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work related to education? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm an academic. I work at uh, the University of Bristol um, and my area... I think in my job title is language and education. And I, I like that very much. It, it captures the two sides of what I'm interested in. So I think most of my work focuses on this thing we call EAL or English as an additional language. I think we're going to talk about why EAL is a very problematic term and, and means a lot of things to different people at different times and places. So I, in my own terms, I might refine that slightly. So I'm, I'm really interested in bilingual children how we can help them learn, how we can help them learn, particularly in schools, although the boundaries of, of how they learn go beyond the school as well. And, and family, for example, are really, really important. So is community. But I'm also interested in, in kids who don't quite fit into to how schools work as well. So a lot of my work is with migrant learners, um, particularly teenage refugees as well. So moving out of the, the primary space. And what unites all of these is, is we have an education system that fundamentally wasn't set up for these kids. And if we were trying to design things that would serve them, it, it wouldn't look very much like it looks now. So we have these tensions built in to education and, and to everything else that they're in, engaged in. I'll talk about some of the work we've done, looking at how education connects to other things later. That means it, it's a constant struggle to rethink how we can get the results, how we can meet their needs, how we can do that in a way that values teachers and teaching and, and everything else that we're engaged in. And I, and I found it's just been, you know, the the most fascinating and challenging and rewarding area to work in because you could take the simple view and say oh bilingual kids right how do we teach them english bish bash bosh we must have fixed that by now but of course the sheer complexity and, and diversity of what we call el learners you know you you could have the children of one of my colleagues both parents professors they happen to speak french at home but but these kids are you know have very very high cultural capital very strong educational backgrounds and we'll have absolutely no problem in school. We'll, we'll finish primary school and secondary school completely bilingual, high achievers. And then you've got kids who who might have spent two, three years basically walking here from Afghanistan or Eritrea. And in some of the children I've worked with in, in my own data collection and research, you know, they they describe stories that are that are absolutely horrifying. You know, trying to trying to cross the Sahara on the back of a a pickup truck that doesn't have quite enough fuel to make it trying to do these routes that there's a lot of the a lot of the boys from afghanistan talked about certain certain things that you could later identify with certain forests in greece which were staged well-known staging posts on the migration journey and they would joke to each other about this kind of 12 country migration and, and, and they're yale as well you got kids in kids in i don't know bradford or or what have you long-standing established bilingual communities there yale but of course these children's experiences have nothing to do with each other so actually trying to get a grip on that complexity is the thing that i think is is 
the the challenge the intellectual challenge that that's really rewarding and it it's married up by this practical challenge of of trying to see how things could work a bit better and that, that balance of the kind of the practical and the academic i think is is um where i'm i spend most of my time i think i i begin to describe myself more now as as a very applied researcher an applied academic and that's a term i can get my head around now you started to talk about some of the um complexity of that category and to some extent the problematic nature in perhaps of that label so perhaps might be a good time to unpack that a little because the the department for education do use the term english as an additional language as a category for particular pupils um well what is the nature of this category and the pupils well, they, that it seeks to identify they kind of do so so what they actually asked to make this ear label is children who are known or believed to speak a love a language other than english and already already we're into a bit of a gray zone um what does that mean in practice so for the dfe a child who is uh, categorized as eal is a child who has been exposed to another language in early childhood and that's a really great starting point for beginning to think about it so you might have a child whose strongest language is english and you'll very quickly see this very often see this at um, the upper end of primary so children who arrive speaking very very little english but who have maybe grown up in england or arrived before the start of school mum and dad speak another language or languages at home those children will quickly become english dominant and by the time they get to the top end of primary what does it mean that they're eal because yes the the language of the home might be another language but their most dominant strongest language is english so we can see immediately that it, it doesn't quite fit everything but it's still a helpful definition number one because it's inclusive so that they're not asking for lots of complex decision making which um, requires you to know quite a lot about the background of the student how they use languages at home it takes all that away because that's not something that that schools are going to get right every time in fact they'll very often not get it right because how would you possibly know right it's not something that will come up necessarily so it's inclusive it means it'll capture the children it needs to um and it's also because having access to another language at home really makes a difference. So it's a good definition in the sense that it, it kind of captures everyone. But the problem with it is it doesn't do anything with that. So once you know that a child is EAL, you don't yet know anything that useful. So the next thing you need to know is, are they any good at English? What's their English proficiency? Um, the DfE started collecting that data in 2016 and ended after, I think, four terms worth of data collection, four long terms, so a year and a bit, um, in 2018. And, and this is <laughs> um, the official reason is because they collected the data they needed to, to carry out the analysis they wanted to. That analysis was never published and I <laughs> strongly suspect never done. Um, the more likely interpretation is that it caught up got caught up with um uh, a bit of a frago around the collection of country of birth and uh nationality data and how that data was shared across different government departments including the home office and they stopped that data collection and i think that the the proficiency data was the baby that went out without bathwater. and it's a huge shame because good quality proficiency data is the number one well, proficiency itself is the number one determinant of how well children will do. So not collecting that data means that we are really hamstrung. So yeah, if we were to talk later about the things that teachers should know, number one is you've got to get proficiency data for EAR because with that, you start to know what you want to do. You you can base your, your teaching decisions on evidence. Without that, you're flying blind. And, and I think it is absolutely criminal. That, that we don't have that at a national level, especially when it's so tantalizingly close. We started, we could have just kept it going and, and we stopped it again. Um, it contrasts with places like Lambeth. So Lambeth have a fantastic head of research, uh, a guy called Fisa Denis, uh, and he's been collecting this proficiency data for decades. So Lambeth 
borough council in London have decades of really good proficiency data and they can tell you an awful lot about their children and how they learn. Wales has been collecting this proficiency data for a long time. So this is not impossible stuff, but so the DFE definition is, is EA is anyone who's exposed to another language, which is inclusive, but doesn't tell you much. The next thing they started collecting, but then stopped was the proficiency data. And that's really, really important. But the big problem with this is that is that Yale is so diverse that actually we need to dig down a little deeper and, and um, schools that have routines for talking about pupils in more detail tend to find this a lot easier. I was going to ask about misconceptions next, but does it make sense to go a bit deeper into it? I mean, if schools can benefit yeah. from sort of a more detailed understanding of the pupils that that are in their sort of catchment their cohorts is is that something that you'd recommend to them yeah absolutely so i'll give you an, i'll give you an example of something that i i come across very often and i'm it, it's a like we talked about it's it's a funny one because i'm always a visitor to people's schools i get the privilege of being a visitor to an awful lot of schools and and you get to see that real cross section but nine times out of ten i don't have to do the actual work so i i will I can share things that I think the evidence tells us are likely to be really, really effective. But I think we just need to remember that you, you, you can't have academics come in saying, oh, do this, 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 and it'll be fixed. You know, what I would hope to do is, is support teaching our teacher expertise to make those professional judgments. So some things I think the evidence tells us are perhaps solid foundations to base those judgments on if that's a good way of putting it we know quite a bit about how long it takes children to acquire english of course the averages hide a lot of variation but it's, it's pretty sound and we know quite a bit about um what happened in primary school so you could have a sense of if you know children's starting points and you know reasonably where you might expect them to get to, you've got a broad flight plan. Now, it, it can't get too detailed because we stopped the data collection. Um, but using, for example, the Lambeth data, Steve Strand at Oxford has done some work with groups of local authorities who happen to have reasonable data. We can, we can tell a fair amount. If I could take a step sideways, I'll give you an example that, that does come up a lot. A lot of schools that I go into will be able to tell me, especially if they have an EL coordinator, very quickly, these are our pupils. Uh, and if I ask, OK, so how would you group these pupils? Well, they'll be able to start very quickly. So, for example, wouldn't be uncommon for a school to have some of their EL cohort from European countries. And these children would typically have age appropriate schooling, often strong family support. They would have um, good levels of literacy in their first language. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily speak English. And so when they come to the school, the priority there would be to right, well, let's let's make sure they have really rich access to English, lots of opportunities, explicit teaching, and we're confident that in a reasonable amount of time they'll make that transfer. And there are things you can do to make that more or, or less effective that we can talk about later. And they might also have a group of uh, of children from let's say Afghanistan from uh, east africa places like eritrea or somalia who have left underdressed they've had to flee their countries for example um they've often had very difficult migration journeys um they may have um gaps in their schooling so that educational history isn't so secure they may or may not have first language literacy so a re and, and of course will often bring a degree of trauma with them and i will mention but not dwell on so i don't end up on a soapbox that the way our legal system treats these different groups has a real impact on on these children's lives because the legal system introduces a great deal of insecurity into the lives of some children and and it's very well evidence that, that insecurity makes learning really really hard and we will remember on recording on a day when <laughs> we switched home secretaries um we will remember that these are deliberate decisions that have a devastating impact on children's lives and i think we we can't we can't not recognize that that political decisions really affect what happens in the classroom for these children but i won't i won't get too high on my horse there okay so so you've got these two groups and, and an el coordinator um can typically describe them very clearly but then you ask the next question which is okay so you've got two groups 
What's your response in the curriculum, in the support that you offer? And that's where it gets a bit trickier because very, very often a school will know very, very well who their children are and they'll know what their EL response is, but there'll be one EL response and it's usually based on those proficiency scores. So this is what we do for our low proficiency learners. This is what we do for our high proficiency learners. And so knowing, knowing about children's proficiency is that great starting point. As you develop it further, I think one of the challenges is to adapt that to the needs of different groups of children. You want to do it in a way that reflects their different needs and, and introduces that breadth without being overwhelmed by the complexity. And, and that can be really hard. And, and I work with a lot of people who, who really struggle to see past children's trauma for example. So if you've got children who have experienced a great deal of trauma, it's really hard not just, you just want to give them a hug. You just want to give them a hug and make everything better for them. And you can't always. And and for a lot of these children who have, who have had very difficult migration journeys, even at a very early age, they want, their parents want the opportunities that a stretching curriculum gives. And it, just as human beings, that can be a really hard thing to get our heads around. But as you as you move on from the absolute core, which is knowing what children's English proficiency is and, and having some strategies or techniques at each stage of proficiency, you start perhaps having a, a bit of a range in how you respond to different needs. And by that point, you're, you're kind of away from the races because you've if you if you've got two curriculum offerings for two groups of pupils, you're so deep into what they need, how that connects to what you can do, that you've got a really, really strong foundation for all the judgments you need to make from then on. So think about how school could respond. Proficiency, I'll keep saying it, knowing their proficiency and having accurate measurements for that is really important. And then thinking, right, well, look, if this kid has arrived and, you know, in the secondary level, I've definitely worked with pupils who, you know, never held a pencil and ruler before. How you support those learners is going to be really different for kids who have um, a really solid educational history to take two extreme examples so as you begin to adapt it um then you can put put more and more sophisticated systems in place and we can we can drill down into detail of what those might be but it's probably getting a bit specific for, for now i mean i'm i'm happy to drill down into some of these details i'm just thinking about the very start of my career um literally the first um first year that i was in teaching after a couple of months uh, a pupil um, came to uh, my classroom who didn't speak any English, um, was originally from Slovakia, but um, the um, he was uh, of, of, of a Roma background. Mm -hmm. And so the, and from the Eastern part of Slovakia. And so there was, a, there was a sense in which even like translation apps mm -hmm. weren't, I mean, this is a bit yeah. before translations that were really doing a good job but also had a very limited experience. In fact, no real experience of formal education. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember distinctly being told by um, those who were trying to support me in the classroom with this pupil that I needed to label everything with, you know, Slovak words. And I tried to convince them, say that, well, at the moment, this might not be hugely useful because I know for a fact that this is this pupil can't actually read Slovak yeah. at the moment so that's <laughs> I don't see how I, they still yeah. absolutely insisted that it was essential um I, but even so I remember the at the very core of my because as a teacher you remember this stuff mm. it, I, I remember the shame of how poorly I felt I was supporting this pupil because yeah. I, I had no idea what to do and I remember this sense of so because it was here he arrived quite at the start of the year i remember some of this sense of shame starting to lift around the six six month mark when it seemed to be the case that he as well he'd already made lots of friends but he was now able to start communicating with them in english and i was able to be more i was able to communicate with him more um to a higher degree but that six months, because it was very, very quiet during that time, mm -hmm. I just felt like a failure the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are lots of teachers in a similar situation. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm not asking you to say, oh, OK, here is, you know, the magic solution to any of this stuff. But any advice that I think yeah. that might under certain circumstances okay. be helpful, I think would be hugely appreciated.
yeah well easy <laughs> to say <laughs> harder to do let's start with this idea of shame and guilt because it you're so right you're so right um this is a conversation i have very often and it, it goes roughly along these lines we're not sure what to do with with eal and the answer isn't a quick fix so then the answer means there's something that we need to think through again and that means that there's something i haven't really been thinking about yet that means there's something i realize that i must have been doing wrong oh my god i've been failing the children and that takes about eight seconds <laughs> you know and and that sense of that means that means i've been failing the children or the child people who choose to spend their lives working with kids are a certain type of people and i'm going to say as a shorthand they're basically very very decent people and and you know they're they're not going to brush these feelings off so let's separate it out a little bit let's remember first of all that although eal is very very far from being a, a priority at the moment it wasn't always so so 2008 2009 there's a really big um workforce development strategy um, run by the the then TDA um, they did a big review of the literature they developed um, four principles for uh, school workforce development so it's to include um, teachers TAs school leaders and everyone who works with children um, there was a lot of work done in it and with the change of government in 2010 there was the remember Michael goes bonfire of the quangos another baby of bathwater so this project probably unnoticed went out when the TDA went out and so it stopped but it was a recognition I mean it's been over a decade now but a recognition that this is a multilingual country you know one in five children speaks another language at home this is a multilingual country and our teaching workforce by and large is not multilingual and so we need to adapt we need strategies to do this it, it wasn't hugely seen as problematic the the EL population has doubled, I mean, roughly speaking, every 10 years for 30 years. And it currently stands at just over 1.6 million. So we know that we know that its its current um lack of emphasis is it's just the, the current lack of emphasis. It doesn't have to be that way, it won't always be that way. We know that most teachers in training won't get more than about 90 minutes. I do a very good 90 minutes. Lots of my colleagues do 90 minutes. If you have a I won't say a hangover is training to, you know a graduate students very responsible people let's say a, a a mild cold you'll miss all your preparation in most teach training programs for um yeah there's very little high quality professional development and by high quality i mean um sustained development so you might you might be a fan of coaching and mentoring you might be a fan of of instructional coaching but what i mean is you're not just getting some twilight sessions or a whole day inset. You're building your capacity and your understanding over time. There's very little of that available. The government has withdrawn. It does sound like I'm really hammering on this government, but I'm afraid they haven't, <laughs> um, they haven't been terrific for the world of EAL. All central government guidance has been withdrawn since 2010. It's been taken out of the Ofsted inspectors' handbooks. It's been taken out of the education inspection framework and its predecessors. And you can see you know as each new framework comes out it's less and less present there's a, a line i think a line and a half in the teacher standards and because it's not inspected and because people aren't trained on it and because the guidance has been withdrawn and because we've stepped back from from actually committing to preparing people for it in a systematic way it falls on the individual and so those feelings of guilt and shame are personal but in no sane world in no sane world should anyone be feeling guilty because they don't know how to do something. This is a this is a um, a system level problem. It's an institutional problem, and it's a policy problem. But it for as always, it falls on the shoulders of individual teachers who are then left feeling dreadful, as you described, because they can't do anything about it. So I, I know that's not the question you asked, but I, I wanted to to take people through it so that we can see the full context. Number one that this will come back, you know, if everything comes around eventually. But also there are lots of specific ways in which it is not an individual teacher's fault. Now, if you had that pupil and you decided, no, nah, I can't be bothered. Yeah, that's your fault. But if you if you want to do something and don't know how, that's not on you. So let's talk about what you might do. 
the absolute first thing faced with a new child, as you describe, who doesn't speak English, um, is is just to smile. <laughs> um, however, however stressful it is for the teacher, it's infinitely more worrying, stressful for the child. So, just being emotionally available, smiling. Some people will go for the hug or the the little touch on the arm. Some people are as tied up in English as I have. <laughs> <laughs> find any kind of physical contact hor- horrifying but but just you know that that goes a long way the next thing i'd say is set up a buddy scheme so a buddying scheme will go a long way now there's a brilliant scheme run by the hampshire local authority team hampshire mtas it is and, and it's called the young interpreters scheme i'm sure could we put a link in the show notes so the young interpreter scheme is is absolutely fab because it's it's super cheap so i think for a whole year subscription it's something like 70 pounds um and it just covers a bit of their development costs and you can get caps and badges and pens and all all these kind of nice things and what it does is it trains children to interpret the school but not the language which means that you you know if you have a largely monolingual school or a school where not many people speak the language of this particular child actually how how many children in your ex school do speak Slovak Roma they're not they're not interpreting the language they're just showing this new person how things work around here and actually a lot of that is a bit of mime of a football come over here you pick up the football you play a bit of football you don't have to speak a lot for that so so first of all i just just is it easy to say don't feel guilty that doesn't seem like a fair thing to say but but recognize that that there's a particular historical moment where you haven't been prepared you're going to have to kind of bootstrap this one can um, I just jump in there a second? Because right, yeah. it's also worth noting that we have another generation of teachers who arguably might not be that prepared because there's no mention of English as an additional language mm. or any equivalent phrase bilingual, multilingual in the core content framework, which seems like a fairly significant oversight. Good people I know who are working in the area of ITT are um, well aware of that oversight and are... Um, paying that oversight no heed if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and and it, you know this is going to keep uh keep going on so actually what what let's step back a, a second because i'm sure a lot of your listeners um will be acting as mentors formally or informally and supporting new teachers on placement in their it um whatever form it takes or, or once they once they fully join the profession you can model that we take this seriously and, and i think listeners to this podcast are people who 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 read who who think deeply about these things um and and asking the newer teachers um about the bilingual pupils in their class and modeling that you show an interest i think is really powerful there's this horrible experience i don't teach i teach mostly on master's programs rather than than um pgcs for example um, but there's this horrible moment every time I do talk to our PGC students, which is they come back after they've done another placement and, and I say, so did you use any of those those strategies we talked about? And they basically say, yeah, it was all brushed off by some of the people I talked to in school. Oh, you don't need that. Oh, that and that. that's not how we do it. And I think being the change there of actually saying, oh, that's really interesting. You know, you have to adopt everything you, your your placement teachers bring in, but but just showing that that you're really interested in in what they're doing makes a huge difference i know the ones the ones who find a kindred spirit or even or even just an interested leader or mentor or colleague who gives them a bit of a bit of encouragement and a bit of rope to pursue it um they come back to the university absolutely buzzing and and really really wanting to develop it the ones who don't come back deflated and i think there's even so obviously there are many forms of initial teacher education and i'm more familiar with with the university-based one but i'm sure it's the same everywhere showing that you're interested and and asking about these pupils and and saying how has it been with them how are they developing and so on and offering that reassurance is going to be it's going to be hugely powerful and i think you're right to, to mention it very strongly so if we were sketching out how we might um how we might proceed recognizing that it's not an individual person's fault just being welcoming warm inclusive you know natural human stuff um not worrying too much about the future like you know nine times out of ten it 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 will come good in the end we just 
need to make sure that it does go that way. Um, a buddying scheme is really, really powerful because actually most of that early language in the first six months, they're going to be learning despite their teachers, not because of it. It is the social interaction with their peers. It's having some buddies. That's where you get all that day to day English. We could talk perhaps later about what's involved in acquiring that kind of language. But a very short version is you need lots of exposure to language, lots of opportunities to use it. Um, and it's got to mean something to you. And you get an awful lot of that when you're when you're just playing, playing with your new friends, you know, in the break times and the lunch hour. And so just doing that, you know, you're setting them up to settle into school really well. And, and kind of taking from that first bit, you might think, well, children who feel secure are going to do all right. Children who know they're valued, know they're loved even, um, who, who feel safe, who find the school predictable, um, who know they can talk to adults and, and have some friends. Yeah, they're, they're going to be all right by and large. Kids, kids who find their school worrying and unpredictable and can't talk to anyone who are very isolated are naturally the children who who we need to to worry for um so so by the time you've got there before you've actually tackled language at all you've done a, a huge amount and you don't need any extra skills to do it i do recommend that the the young interpreter scheme but you don't have to use it i just think you know there's a really good one that is very very cheap it's a no-brainer but if you want to set up your own and, and lots of schools have them that's great all, all you need to do is to make sure that that these kids are, are are getting a bit of security. It's a really dis uh, disruptive time, um, especially if you've migrated internationally. So after that, what what could you do in the classroom? Well, then we come to how we actually learn language. So so I think we can think about language learning, language teaching, if you like, explicit language teaching, and we can think about language acquisition. So I'm going to basically um, summarize and you know horribly butcher for 40 or 50 years worth of really good research here but but in short um if the children are involved in the life of the classroom they're going to be exposed to all the language and so we always would want to recommend against withdrawing them for additional support except in very limited specific circumstances as much as possible if you can include them in the life of the classroom um it's going to be okay so what would that mean in practice well it might mean for example, um, that you sit children who are newly arrived next to high achievers in your class. By and large, if, uh, and this is for all phases and ages, if you tell a kid they're going to achieve well, they're, they're likely to live up to it. If you tell them that they're going to struggle, they tend to live up to it. So sitting new arrivals with high achievers, it means they get that really high quality model and that's going to help them um, a great deal. Include them in your classroom talk. So if you're not yet confident that they will be able to respond to a question, and actually having the language skills and the confidence to do that are separate. So they might actually be able to answer your questions if you're speaking them one-to-one, -one, kneeling next to the table, in a whole class situation to direct a question to them, they might not be able to. So that's a judgment you're obviously very well equipped to make. Um, but you can still include them in the course class by saying, for example, oh, that's something you mentioned earlier when I was coming around, wasn't it, Kira? Um, Chris, did you talk to your partner about that? You're nodding. Fantastic. I'm really glad that you did. So by keeping them involved in the, all the talk of the classroom and the activity of the classroom, that's really going to make sure they've got all those raw materials. They need lots and lots of rich language around them, directed to them. They need opportunities to use it. And then it's got to be meaningful. And actually, classroom talk really is meaningful. Um, and by meaningful, you know, there's a reason to ask and a reason to answer. So if we went, my favorite example is to go around a class and say, do you have, so let, let's try it. Kira, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have two brothers and a sister. Oh, Kira. Yes, I have one brother. Repeat. Yes, I have one brother. Correct. Chris, do you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, I have two sisters. Yes, I have one brother. <laughs> yes, I have one brother. <laughs> so, you know, I can see their faces and they are, they are not impressed with my teaching skills. Um, there is, you know, we could think of that kind of language practice drilling and we could extend that to all kinds of worksheets. Um, by and large, every time I mention worksheets, someone looks at me and says, we don't do worksheets in primary. And two minutes later, someone else goes, oh, we do actually. 
um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of of that kind of drilling and practice activity um, that are often used, and and that that can take different forms. And a lot of it happens when you're trying to pre-teach vocabulary, sort of repetition of the key words before they encounter them in the class. But there's no meaning there. There's no reason for you to say those words. Yes, I have one brother. You you patently don't. So when it's true when there's a reason for you to ask an answer and that generally means there's an information gap so i don't know how many brothers or sisters you have you do i would like to know that's why we're exchanging that information there is you know we might also talk um as an aside about facet communication which is about maintaining relationships so having asked you about your brothers and sisters and you know you give me looks and say what is he on about i might just pause and say you you're all right mate yeah i'm fine so we might move that that might be more about the relationship building side of education that's really important too but but in a classroom setting a lot of what we're doing is is we're communicating because we want to exchange information that's really powerful because that's what language is for so the more we do that in the classroom the more we include children in the talk of the classroom the more they're going to benefit and what's happening under the bonnet if you like is their brains are ferocious pattern spotters all our brains are so they are piecing together the patterns in language that they're exposed to and and the brain attends to meaning there's some brilliant research on this that i always misquote so i shall misquote it to you too but it's essentially this if you uh put someone either in an mri machine or, or strap a load of electrodes to their head and you uh, present them with a sentence the horse kicked the fence. Absolutely fine. If you present them with a sentence, the horse slept the fence. You've, you've got a meaning error. Why would it? Sleep doesn't fit there. That's not kicked, jumped, sure, but sleep, no. If you present them with the horse kicking the fence, we've got a grammatical error. And the brain responds more quickly to meaning errors. And we are talking like fractions of a second here. You have to have a load of electrodes. It's not hugely applicable to the classroom. The brain responds more quickly to meaning errors than it does to grammatical errors. And we can extend that. There's been quite a lot of research um, looking at which bits of morphosyntax, so how we build up words and, and connect them into strings, um, get retained. So the third person S in English um, is famously difficult for speakers of our languages to retain it takes ages and ages to consistently use that because it's functionally carries no meaning right it's useless she goes well we know who it is because the she so if we say she go or she goes we know exactly what is meant so it carries no meaning particularly and and for that reason it's very very slow to learn those brains, they're looking for patterns, but they are really picking up on meaning. The brain responds to meaning and, and recognizes those as the most important patterns and is more likely to retain them. So by including that child in the life of the classroom, making sure they're, they're part of all the, the classroom talk, you're giving them all the raw materials and you're also giving them the cues to, to attend to those bits of language. That makes us ask real questions about um, withdrawal, which might be in a primary setting, um, you might have the um, a teaching assistant, for example, work with a small group to prep some vocabulary ready for the class. That, uh, you know, in very broad terms, but generally speaking, that would seem to be effective because you're, you know, you're, you're giving them some preparation so that they can in, engage more fully in the class. Compare that with having having a teaching assistant or either sit with that child through the lesson. Sometimes it's done brilliantly. And, and that person really helps the child to engage with what's happening in the classroom. But at other times, that child's world shrinks to the person next to them. And they're not getting the full language of the classroom. They're not getting involved in the discussion. They don't get what's meaningful and what's not. They don't get opportunities to use their language. And so you can see here how, how perhaps those kind of broad principles, which I think are very strongly evidence-based principles that we might work with, there are lots of ways to apply them. And this is where I say that, you know, it's, it's not my job to tell people what to do, but but there are principles to base your decisions on, which I think lead you to, to pretty robust decisions, I think, fairly quickly. And so we're going to pause there.
because we have lots more to share next week. I, I hope you agree that that has been a fantastic chat so far, and I'm really looking forward to sharing next week's episode with you. But until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.